Hello there, welcome back to my channel. My name is Grace and I'm a writer who lives in London. The Land of Decoration, which was published in 2012, Professor of Poetry, which was published in 2013, and The Offering, which was published in 2015. I also taught creative writing at Manchester University and on this channel so far I haven't really talked about books much, but I thought um, maybe I should and maybe some of you would like that. And to that end, today I thought we could talk about what makes a book great. Um, not just really good, excellent or brilliant, but great, like a classic. It's something I've had a long time to think about, I suppose, because my undergraduate degree was in English literature and you're kind of surrounded by all of these great masters and these great voices and um, in their shadow and then my masters was a research MA on T.S. Eliot. So I've had a long time to think about that and even long before I've always read books and some have stayed with me of course as everyone has their favourite authors. I suppose that's the nub of the matter because what makes a book great is subjective, it's very hard to argue and that goes back to the question of what art is and, and why it's important, do we need it and how can we judge how valuable a work of art is. So because I get quite scatterbrained when I make these videos, I made some notes. So if I look down I'm just referring to these notes. And the first thing I wanted to say is these days it seems that there are a lot more people writing novels and getting published. So the market is saturated with a lot of often very good books. If you look back to the 30s or 20s, say, when Virginia Woolf was writing her novels, there were a fraction of women writers and writers of both sexes. And that's been the case throughout history, partly because people didn't have the financial means or time to write. But these days, all the more so, it makes it really hard to find the special stuff. And of course there are a proliferation of creative writing degrees and courses now throughout the country. So in a sense you can learn to write a very good book. And I think um, a course can teach you to write a very good book. But what I don't believe is that you can learn how to write a great book. Because in a way, any writer that's written a great book, it's not even about them anymore. Um, I think something, and I, I expect a lot of other people would agree with me about this, something comes in from elsewhere, a kind of energy, a force, and that writer themselves is kind of eclipsed, they're kind of irrelevant, although of course um, the work of art comes through their own um, film, their own prism of observation, so we have their style, we have their unique way of looking at the world. But with a great work, which is a tour de force, um, that comes from somewhere else. And a lot of writers and artists testify to the fact that um, sometimes they've kind of been taken over by... Um, this sounds a bit mystical and esoteric. Um, I don't mean they're possessed or they're channeling something, but these are actually quite useful metaphors to think about the creative process. There's a really good article by a writer called Tom McCarthy, which I'll link below. And in this essay he talks about writers being like a kind of radio, and they, they tune in to a certain channel. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. In my three novels, when it was going well, it was so easy, and that's not bragging, it's almost the opposite, because I kind of took a back seat at that time and and the words just came easily and conversely the bits that drag, I think the bits that drag and the dead wood. The last thing I wanted to say was in this modern age I feel there's less and less in the way of nutrition and nourishment in a physical sense and a creative and spiritual sense. So everyone knows that food isn't as nutritious as it was years ago. Um, 
our air is polluted, our land is polluted, our water is polluted. Um, we consume drugs knowingly and unknowingly. And that actually, that's the same with our mental and spiritual life. There's a heck of a lot of junk food out there, junk media news, junk entertainment. And I'm not saying that I don't partake of this. Unfortunately, I do in reasonable quantities because it's kind of like a, uh, a fix like when I'm low on energy. But ultimately, it depletes you. And my point is that I don't feel you can um, create something really substantial on a kind of high energetic plane, something that's transcendent if we take in so much toxic and low quality nourishment in all these different forms. So I think that's another challenge facing writers today. It's not easy to prove a work of art is substantial and is nourishing though, unlike food or water or the air we breathe, which can all be tested and measured in some way. Um, with a book, there's no objective test. T.S. Eliot said, we sense the value or quality of something as a pulse, as a pulse less strong and stronger. So it's kind of like a felt, intuitive thing. And I suppose it's akin to our sense of self-direction in life. If we have a, a strong inner compass that directs us towards certain people and certain situations or away from them, whether we have a good instinct for quality rather than the insubstantial or the initially impressive but actually kind of empty instead. I think great writing has something that can possibly be described as depth or resonance. I often think of writing as music and lots of the same terms apply. Um, again, my second novel, The Professor of Poetry, tries to explore a little bit how words and music are similar and that there's a large intuitive response to both rather than a cerebral, reasoned, intellectual response. I often feel that academia uh, kind of deadens a work and I was going to be an academic but I'm really glad that I got ill and my, kind of my life changed course because I like to feel things and not have to analyse why I feel something. I also, touch, I also touch on this in a collection of poetry I wrote for the Bronte Society called Every Sound in Line, which you can find on my website and I'll link the page below. So in the remainder of this video I just want to touch on a few characteristics that I feel great works of literature have. The first characteristic is they're not necessarily free of faults, excesses or absurdities. I feel that great writing can often be quite different to excellent writing. For instance, Kafka's work, I feel, and I almost did this once, um, I attended a creative writing evening class for a few, uh, about, I think it was about five or six months. And I was tempted at one point to submit one of Kafka's short stories, a, you know, a really obscure, lesser known story, because he wrote so, so much. Um, and I, I felt maybe the tutor wouldn't know it was by Kafka and see what sort of criticism came back. Because Kafka commits all sorts of offences um, according to modern creative writing practice. And yet the cumulative effect of his work it suggests it is truly great. So to sum up the first point, I feel that greatness in literature is not to do with proficiency or virtuosity. It can have a lot of faults. I think another characteristic of greatness is it, it remains with you throughout your life. So with an excellent book, you may respond to it quite strongly when you first read it, but then 10 years down the line, you kind of fall out of love with it. But great literature is not like that. It stays with you because it's bigger than you. So however far you go in your life, however much you change and develop, it's, it remains solid and itself because it's just so much larger and deeper than you.
great literature isn't of the moment. So not only does it stand the test of time, but it may not even be accepted at the moment. When it first appears, it may be banned, it may be not understood, it may be ignored. Or it may just not be as rapturously appreciated as it goes on to be. Um, I've thought for a while now that great books, maybe if I had to decide one thing, actually, <coughs> is that, do I, uh, do I think about, no, no, it couldn't just be taken on its own, this criteria, but basically I think great books are unique, so much so that I sometimes wonder if that's all great literature consists of, uh, being utterly unlike anything else. Of course, that goes back to the style of the writer, essentially, but I think style is a lot more than just a surface embellishment, but reflects the substance of the novel, um, its heart and vision of the author. Another way in which I think great books can be a little bit eclipsed these days is because everyone is trying to be different. In fact, there's a kind of I would say quirkiness and whimsy is in vogue at the moment in almost every area of life, not just literature. What, what happens when that's the case is that everything becomes homogenous and nothing is really unique anymore except the stuff that isn't trying to be different at all. When I wrote The Land of Decoration, um, this first book, I fell into the trap of trying to make it a little bit more quirky than my instinct told me it should be in order to appeal to agents and publishers because I knew it would be tough to be noticed and to get an agent in the first place and so it's a little bit sweeter, a little bit more whimsical than I actually like to read myself because I was trying to judge the the cl literary climate at that point in time and I guess I judged pretty well because it was reasonably successful um, largely because it was kind of of the moment that's not to say hopefully there are not deeper elements to it and I sometimes wish I hadn't kowtowed to what I saw as the literary climate quite so much at the time my second novel, The Professor of Poetry, um, I did something a little bit similar. I compromised in that I made it quite plotty, as much as I could, because my instinct was to make it more meditative. But again, I compromised and made it... Uh, I tried to make sure re readers turned the pages. And in my third novel, The Offering, I did the same thing to an even greater degree. So much so that one reviewer said it kind of resembled a detective novel. And again, if I'd been really true to me, I would just have made it pretty much all like the the diary passages in the middle of the novel, where the 13-year-old girl is writing about how she starts to experience what she thinks of as God in the natural world. The fact that I kind of tweaked my initial vision for those three novels in order to make them accessible and publishable. And it may not have been necessary, but I did it anyway, because I wrote them all in a bit of a bubble without any feedback, virtually. I think there was, there was one reader, two readers. But not for all three novels. So I needn't have had to do that, but I did. Um, and the fact that I did would make those novels more esteemed by, say, a creative writing course. And um, I was ticking more of the boxes of how a novel should be. Which leads on to my fourth point. That great writing can't be taught. I just don't believe if a person worked their whole life and became excellent and wrote Booker Prize winning novels, um, they still might not write a great novel. Uh, and 
I really believe there's more in common between terrible writing and genius than excellent writing and genius. My fifth, my fifth point is that great writing doesn't have a message. So the author doesn't burden their work with their own ideological, political or moral ideas. A great book is not consciously trying to say anything, it just is. And I feel examples of this might be Cormac McCarthy's work, Marilyn Robinson's work, um, Kafka's work, W.G. Sebald, Melville, Ernest Hemingway, Joseph Conrad, the Bronte sisters, less so Anne actually although she really actually furthers women's plight and position in literature a great deal. Um, but I just don't feel that an ideological novel or a novel which has a moral purpose can be a great work. And William Faulkner falls into writers I consider great. A writer that straddles both camps, I think, is J.M. Kutsia, the South African uh, Nobel laureate. I feel there are passages in his novels which touch greatness, in Waiting for the Barbarians and in the Heart of the Country. There are parts which describe the natural world, which are quite transcendent, and in the life and times of Michael Kay, when uh, Michael Kay is starving and kind of delirious, there are, I would say, mystical passages of great beauty and depth. Kutsia also threads through his work kind of <clears throat> a little trail of breadcrumbs for literary critics and theorists, which I don't like. It's almost as if he's writing the perfect book for an undergraduate to study. Um, kind of getting in the good books of truffle hunting literary theorists, um, embedding clever pointers and nuggets of, of literary theory. Um, so I feel that kind of makes his novels less pure, but that's just, my, that's just my opinion. So to clarify, I don't feel literature should be a vehicle to point out political injustice, change human relations, or concern itself with moral dilemma. It can definitely bring these things to light, but I feel it has to rise above <clears throat> a certain viewpoint or agenda and encompass all viewpoints and all agenda. It just has to portray um, without like a, any colour, without any film. It just has to see something. Yeah. And my final point touches on the earlier idea about music and literature, is that I think great literature sounds good. And I don't just mean um, literally sounds good. It sounds... <laughs> It sounds deep, it sounds substantial. In Taoist writings, the I represents the yang and the ear the yin. And the ear can measure what the I can only guess at. When I read that, it kind of resonated a lot with me because I put a, I put a lot of store by how something sounds, someone's voice, or um, just sounds in general have a big effect on me. I can get really depressed listening to man-made sounds like traffic or a machine, uh, whereas for some people they don't notice them. I can get really tired as well. But um, natural sounds energise. Similarly with a person, I would be much more attracted to their voice than the way they look, or I could be attracted to the way they look, but then when they speak, um, it, it just all is irrelevant because their sound is kind of doesn't feel right to me. So, a composer has to listen first before he writes music, and I think it's the same for a writer. They have to be silent. And when I read, it's really hard to read when there are other sounds around, because I feel um, prose, and of course poetry, but prose is like music, so it clashes with music if music is played. So the way a novel sounds is really important to me. 
Of course, different things sound good to different people and different books seem good to different people. But there is a general consensus and I'm not sure why that is. Um, humans seem to have a rough idea of what beauty is, although it does change a lot through the ages. But the infants, you know, babies have been shown to stare at beautiful people. Um, and all humans have a kind of inbuilt comprehension of harmony and disharmony. I'm not sure if that would be the case if they'd been raised by, say, chimpanzees or wolves, but if we're raised in society, we will seem to have a general inbuilt um, idea of what's beautiful. And so there is a general canon of great literature. And within that, we each find what we're most drawn to or what most resonates with us or what sounds good and that is my little video on what I feel makes a great work of literature I would love to hear what you think and what really does it for you what excites you, moves you what you feel rises above the rest thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon, bye